wonders. I don't know. <laughs> Hello, hello. Welcome to a new episode of Hannah Wonders, quarantine edition. I am so happy that the episode that ended up being up on the docket next is the one that we're discussing today, um, because we all need a little bit of light and levity. And I had no idea when I picked that this pod was going to be coming up on this date that we were going to need something so blonde. <laughs> but uh, this week on Hannah Wonders, we're getting down and nerdy with Elle Woods, Bruno, and Emmett in Legally Blonde. I actually, I always start off the pod by going, why did I pick this one? Why did I decide that this was the episode that I wanted to do? And what's so funny is um, somebody actually wanted me to do this podcast because he was curious as to why people love Legally Blonde, the musical, so much. So a uh, shout out to the Colonel at Popcorn Promises Podcast and my sister for being a huge Legally Blonde nerd. Um, the Colonel, Jason Bromley, um, asked me why would people be so obsessed with this? Like, I get that the movie is a cult classic and people love it, but was the musical that different or was it just that good? And, and I'm going to answer all those questions for you today. But the important thing is that this is a show that was true to its source material and provided a lot of fun of mu in musical theater. And that is really what we're here for today. I just wanted you guys to be able to learn a little bit about this bubbly, silly musical. And then if you'd like to, you can actually source it online um, on YouTube if you want to see the stage version. So um, go ahead and you know, catch up with me and then hop on YouTube and look that up and you guys can actually watch the MTV special version of it. But we'll get into more of that later. I have been obsessed with this musical since it came out. Um, I was a junior in high school when the Broadway cast recording was released. And it was awesome because as if we don't have enough <laughs> roles for um, white girls with blonde hair, here comes another one. Um, and it was, you know, coming after Wicked was released a few years earlier. So this was just another powerhouse. And I always used to use this show for my senior solos um, back when I was actually still the soprano and it had so many tough songs in it it had so many fun um, lyrical choices in it and it was naturally very funny it's very easy to sing these songs with a comedic voice because it, it, they are written to be so silly and um, so it was something that I, that I really got into right when it came out and then when I was going through some really hard things and changing universities, actually, um, due to some tough times in my life, um, so much better, the song So Much Better got me through so much. <laughs> and um, so did, you know, crying and belting the Legally Blonde Ballad, the title song. So it's a very special musical to me. And I honestly didn't know until I started this research that other people felt differently. I didn't know that um, the critics had responded so negatively to it, which actually isn't surprising after I read through critic responses. Um, but I think that for the populace and for those of us that grew up with Legally Blonde the movie and fell in love with Reese Witherspoon in the film, this was just the natural next step. And it was different enough that it felt unique and original while still being straight, like pulled from the film. So it was the best of both worlds. And especially when, you know, you're 18 and you're me and I was this bubbly pink goof that <laughs> loved. Um, I was very high energy and 
um, while I was never going to be a sorority girl in particular, you know, I definitely identified with her energy and her um, outlook on life. And so Elwood is a special character to me. And I know she is for a lot of people. So I was really excited to get into this one. I also had no idea that Legally Blonde was meant to be a play on the the legal term legally blind. And the idea is being that she was so blonde that it could be registered as a disability. Um, and, and it's horrible, um, but it is an interesting play on, on the term. This whole franchise um, started with a book that was written by a woman named Amanda Brown in 2001. And it was actually based on her real life experiences. She was a blonde who attended Stanford Law School. She picked Stanford because of the amazing mall that was nearby. I kid you not. She loved Elle magazine and she didn't fit in at all with her peers. So while she was in school, she would write about her experiences with a fluffy feather pen on pink paper. And she ended up writing a manuscript uh, on this pink paper that she sent out to a couple publishers. And when she sent it, the reason her novel got picked up is because it stood out in the pile of submissions because it was on pink paper. So if you remember from the original film, the uh, Harvard application she submits is on scented pink paper. um, And that's what she wanted. They wanted to get in the film is that that's how she actually stood out was by being herself and being this over the top pink personality. After that, novel was released. It also became a young fiction novel, um, a young adult fiction novel by Natalie Standiford. And that was interesting because it was, I'm not sure like if the rights were shared or, you know, if Natalie Standiford had written to Amanda Brown and said, I want to continue on the journey with Elle Woods as a character. I'm not sure how that was negotiated, but I do know that the series of, um, it was called Legally Blonde, what became, um, much more like it was episodic so it was smaller chapter books that told different stories it was like the adventures of Elle Woods and that did continue but it wasn't picked up and as popular as the original novel by Amanda Brown. Producer Mark Platt found the unpublished manuscript and um, so before it was even fully published as a novel, he knew he wanted to see it on screen. So he wrote to screenwriters Karen McCullough and Kristen Smith and they spent two days on the Stanford campus doing research for their screenplay and um, all of the screenplay was based directly from the novel. But both the University of Southern California and Stanford refused to let their names into the film. Uh, They were afraid that it would give it a bad idea. And this was all fixed by coming up with a fake university. So they came up with the California University, L.A., um, it was critical for the director that and Reese Witherspoon at the time that Elle be very multidimensional. She was in the novel um, because Amanda Brown was a real person. So it, she actually kind of <laughs> took this, what she called an anthropological journey through sororities on campus at the University of California so that she could really dive into sorority life. What were these girls like, but not just on the surface? What was the stereotype? But what did they actually eat and talk like? And what were their hopes and wishes and dreams? She really wanted to make sure that Elle Woods wasn't just this flat, stereotypical character. It was also during this research on the campus where her and costume designer at the time had decided that pink was going to be her signature color. And it was absolutely obvious the moment they walked into the sorority houses, that pink was very prevalent. So she knew that that had to be her signature color. One of my favorite tidbits about this movie is that everyone's favorite scene and a scene that has totally totally folded itself into the fabric of our our pop culture references is the bend and snap. And that scene was actually written last minute, drunk in a bar, 
um, between McCullough and Smith when they were trying to flesh out Paulette's character and they were trying to figure out how they could, you know, should she be going back to get her dog? You know, there was this FedEx character. How did we want to get into that? And so um, she decided to go forward and um, create the bend and snap. And she literally did it in the middle of this bar and they wrote an entire scene around it. You know, I just realized that I'm talking about the bend and snap and we haven't even taken a moment to kind of refresh our brains on the plot and the synopsis of Legally Blonde. The film and the mu- musical both have very similar plot lines and um, and the protagonist and antagonist are very much the same. So we meet Elle when she's a very successful fashion major um, at her university in California. And she has a boyfriend named Warner and he and she have been together. They're a power couple at the university and she thinks he's getting ready to propose. And the night that he is supposed to be proposing, he actually breaks up with her at this very romantic dinner. So once she goes through this little bit of depression and doesn't change her clothes for a week, she decides, well, if he's going to go to Harvard, then why don't I go to Harvard and I'm going to follow him and I'm going to convince him that he's wrong and I can also be this very serious, studious person. So she travels across the country to go to Harvard. And when she arrives, she is hated by her peers. Um, She's definitely plays up the dumb blonde stereotype, which we quickly learn is not who she is, but that's how her peers react to her. And again, based on Amanda Brown's book, these interactions were based in reality. This is how she was really treated. So Elle is going through these same things. She realizes that Warner already has a new girlfriend who he's known for a long time. And so she's devastated by this. And this is when she decides that instead of being sad and wallowing, she's going to actually buck up and she's going to push herself so that she can get her law degree. And she's going to be better than than um, Vivian, his new girlfriend, and prove to him that she is super smart. And so it kind of all starts in that place of wanting to get the boy back. But over time and working with um, her friend Emmett, who is the TA in one of her classes, He helps show her that she is more than her hair, that she's more than the blonde, that she has so much more to offer. And she ends up landing an internship. And it's a very coveted internship at the university. So she starts the internship and the point of um, her first case is to get Brooke Wyndham out of prison and she has been she has been arrested and accused of killing her husband Well, through various trials, um, she starts to, she and Elle develop this beautiful bond because they're both from the same sorority and Brooke ends up opening up to her and is like, you, I have an alibi, but you can't tell anyone. And this alibi is apparently that she gets lipo. (laughs) Um, And she's like, you can't tell anybody because I'm a fitness guru and no one will ever listen to me. My career will be over. So Elle decides, okay, well, I can't save her with this, so I'm going to have to try and find another way. During this process, the day before the trial, her professor decides to make a move on her. He offers her a summer job with his office, and that's a huge, huge, huge deal. And then he makes a pass at her. And Elle being Elle says, absolutely not. I'm not interested. And he fires her. So she leaves. She packs up and she's prepared to go back to California and she feels like nobody took her seriously in the first place. All the professor wanted was to, you know, hit on her and it completely devalues all of the work that she had done. But luckily, she trusts a couple friends and tells them what happened, and they rally behind her, and she ends up going to court, and with her and her classmates, they end up saving the day, with Elle having a great courtroom experience, and it's super fun to watch. And um, it actually comes down to something that only she would know uh, in the court. That's how she ends up being able to free Brooke, by proving somebody else did it on the stand. Um, this show is really special to this movie, um, and the musical. 
because instead of ending with it being like a rom-com, which they had considered with this like she wins the case and then her and Emmett, her, you know, TA from class that she's fallen in love with, they kiss on the steps of the state capitol and it's beautiful and that's the end. But instead of going that direction, they were like, that's not Elle, though. This isn't a rom-com. It's not about her relationship with Emmett, even though that's really cute. It's about Elle and, and what she's overcome. So they decide to do kind of a where are they now? They go four years into the future and they show where everyone is. And she ends up proposing to Emmett um, once she's completed law school. And she's valedictorian and it just shows that she was not this dumb blonde that she once she stopped doing things for other people and started doing them for herself she was so much stronger and brighter and i love that message of course along the way what people really love is how ridiculous this this film is and that's what they capture in the musical as well that it's just very silly it's very high paced um and they they just get this great feeling of sisterhood and feminism and a little bit of romance but you're always cheering for Elle and it's it's interesting because at first you're like oh my god who is this and it could be you know um it could have been portrayed more like I'm not sure how many how many people who listen to this podcast have seen the house bunny but it could have very much been like that where she is this dumb blonde and kind of stumbles on accident into success but instead Elle had that moment where she had to dig deep and decide to do things for herself instead of trying to get the guy back, that it wasn't about that anymore. The film was released in July of 2001, and it was starring, of course, Reese Witherspoon, Luke Wilson, Selma Blair, Victor Garber, Matthew Davis, and my favorite, Jennifer Coolidge. Uh, I absolutely love her. She played Paulette. And um, while I love Orfe, who played the role of Paulette on the Broadway stage, um, I definitely feel like Jennifer Coolidge just created the role of, of Paulette. She's so sweet and weird and a little dumb, but we love her. So that was just like, <laughs> that was a winner for me. She, Jennifer Coolidge also, um, she starred in a couple of Disney movies as well, like Cinderella Story with Lizzie McGuire, or Lizzie McGuire with Hilary Duff. And uh, she's just, she's she always kind of plays the same uh, daft character, but I, I'll never get tired of it. I love it. The film was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy, and Reese Witherspoon was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Actress. But it was a sleeper hit. While it only took in $20 million during the opening weekend, it went on to bring in $141 million worldwide. And it was so successful, it led to two sequels, um, one in 2003 and one in 2005. Um, but I don't think about the third one because that was like, it was the weird one with like the girls. I don't know. The, so the sequel of Legally Blonde 2, Red, White, and Blonde was also amazing. Highly recommend. The musical of Legally Blonde is the creation of Nell Benjamin and Lawrence O'Keefe with a book by Heather Hatch. This um, The show was directed and choreographed by Jerry Mitchell, and the original cast included Laura Bell Bundy, Christian Borle, or Borle, depending on how you like to say it, and Orfe. So Laura Bell Bundy, oh my god, I love her. To me, she will always be Elle Woods. I don't I know other pe- women, amazing, amazing women have played this role, but because I was introduced to her through the cast recording, she just has this affect to her voice that just makes me believe in Elle Woods. Like it's, it's silly, but she has this way of belting a ballad that'll just bring you to your knees. Unfortunately, she went on to do some pretty terrible country music, but whatever, that's her solo career. Like I said before, the musical kept very close to the original plot and even turned major scenes in the film into now very well-known musical numbers, like The Bend and Snap. There are 18 musical numbers, and Elle sings 16 of them while having 19 costume changes. 
The musical premiered in pre-Broadway tryouts in San Francisco in early 2007 at the Golden Gate Theater and moved to Broadway in April of that year, but opened at the Palace Theater to very mixed reviews and really sad ticket sales. It did receive uh, seven Tony nominations and 10 Drama Desk nominations, but it didn't take any home. And actually, people were pretty surprised by this because even though critics were not as happy with it, like people enjoyed it fine. And there was some amazing talent on that stage. Ben Brantley, who I've discussed before on this pod, um, is a very prophetic theater critic in New York. And he said, it's high energy empty calories and expensive looking, a hymn to the glories of girlishness. Kind of rough, but that is kind of what everybody said. Like if you are into the bubbly, silly musicals, you'll probably enjoy it. Just don't expect too much. Some people felt that it had weak plot points, but I don't really understand that if you enjoy the movie because it's very similar. And, um, you know, a lot of people said that it just seemed like it was a little empty And I don't know why. I just never got that feeling. I always felt like this was, I mean, the beginning's very silly and it starts with a song that can be very obnoxious. It's literally called, Oh My God, You Guys. But to me, that just starts the show at a tone so that it can transfer and you can watch how much Elle grows throughout it. You know, it starts with kind of this vapid, oh my God, Elle's getting engaged. Oh my God, what is she going to wear? We should go help her. And then she's, you know, getting dressed and picking out an outfit. And um, we get to see her kind of show off in front of her friends to a mean sales lady at the department store. And, you know, it it, it is a very... Mm, fluffy way to start the show but the song is catchy as all hell and like I said I think it just starts the show in a place that is so high and so bubbly and so pink that by the end when you see what Elle accomplishes and how much she's changed it, it provides a place for her to go so to me I, I ne- that never really bothered me and it has some of like the si- the silliest breakup song ever, which is serious, where you think that he's going to propose and then he totally throws off the song, um, which is super fun. Like it just to me was always very surprising. So I just never got like it, it seems as if the people that that hated it went into it wanting to hate it and I'm really curious how many people that reviewed it negatively didn't like the concept of the film either because it is it is very similar (laughs) and I honestly think that it just kind of enhances and tells the story in a different way that's super relatable and and catchy in fact I'm not the only person that thinks that the songs were catchy in 2007 the cast recording was released and hit number one for cast recordings and number 86 on the billboard top 200 which is pretty crazy overall but the show just didn't do well. Um, In fact, it was kind of considered a flop, which I'll get to some of the numbers in a second, but it didn't recoup um, its spend on Broadway. So the producers are starting to get a little nervous and they decide to do something that was a little bit new. In September of 2007, so the show had been running for about six months, the original Broadway cast recorded a live performance, which aired on MTV in October of that year. And while tickets were still not moving the way they had hoped, there was one last draw. They had created this partnership with MTV. So the producers went to them and said, we want to create a show about finding the next Elle Woods. Like, who's going to take over for Laura Bell Bundy when she leaves? So that was when they decided to create Legally Blonde, The Search for Elle Woods. And it became a TV phenomenon. I remember when it was on and like... I tend to not like those shows, Um, but essentially the way that it worked is they would audition. They auditioned thousands and thousands of girls. They even pulled a couple that they knew that they were interested in in seeing on stage, which included Lena Hall before she had changed her name. So she was in the running for that, which is totally crazy to imagine her in that position. Um, But they kind of held these initial tryouts And then they started filming when they were at 15 girls. 
And of those 15, some of them were plants and they already knew they wanted, they were going to push them forward. But every week they would have different challenges related to being in Legally Blonde. And then they would have to do some sort of performance or challenge. And then the girls would get cut one by one. So it was a crazy reality show. All the girls had to live together during the process. Everything was filmed. Um, it was, I, I read all, I read way too much about this show. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what got me into it, but it was fascinating. I'm always fascinated what happens behind the scenes of reality TV. So the, the girls were picked off one by one. Um, it was very emotional for sure. And the challenges had to do with like learning the choreography and then they had 24 hours to perform a certain number. There was one piece where they were like, riding stationary bikes while singing the song so much better and they had to do it for like four hours and of course that's not something that Laura Bell Bundy would have had to do but she did say when you perform eight shows a week as Elle Woods you have to be in perfect shape because it is nonstop. like I said she did 16 out of the 18 songs in the show L is singing in or is taking a lead in and the choreography is insane it's so much fun but that also means that the stamina and the cardio that is required to keep that up is ridiculous and it's very hard to find so these girls were just dripping sweat they were exhausted and then they're belting notes while on a stationary bike for hours at a time so personally it sounds like my own you know hell to have to like <laughs> prove you can belt while running you know but yeah I I understood the angle. It just seemed like for filming purposes because they needed so much footage. They had them doing these exercises for a long period of time, which is crazy. But the show culminated in selecting one actress towards the end. And that was the girl that got to open after Laura Bell left. So there were this wasn't the first show to do this. This is actually the third before um, Legally Blonde, The Search for Elle Woods, we had You're the One That I Want, which was cast in Greece, and How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria, which was in London, and that was casting Sound of Music, the, the Maria for Sound of Music. The difference with these previous reality shows for casting musicals is they were happening before the show ever started. So there's some Positive is a negatives to that. The positive is that the actresses that were selected got to kind of be more part of the artistic creation of the show and it built up momentum before the show ever opened because people were seeing these these girls and these women competing and then they were like, oh, I want to go see so and so in Greece. I saw them on TV. So it built up the excitement and the media frenzy around the show opening. Legally Blonde did it in the middle of the run of the show. And so it was, it didn't help contribute to ticket sales. But what it did was create giant Legally Blonde nerds <laughs> because we all knew what key so much better ended up in or and the choreography during positive what that that choreo was I knew all of those counts I knew every single beat in that number um and the producers said after the show aired you could hear when the lights would go down in the theater all of the people would be chattering because they knew trivia about the show and that was so special to be able to air because Legally Blonde was working in tandem with MTV Legally Blonde was able to provide shots from the show. They were able to use the set from the show. Uh, Laura Bell Bundy came on as a special guest star. So it was all, it was more involved in the production, but it just didn't stimulate sales the way they needed to because they were already so far in the hole financially. So a little bit of, you know, positives and negatives there. It is a bummer that it didn't help the show run longer, but it was it was really cool that we had this inside scoop into the show unlike we had seen before with the other two. 
the winner of that production or <laughs> of that sh- reality show was um, a woman named Bailey Hanks. She was 20 at the time and she played Elle on Broadway from July of 2008 until October when the show closed. So unfortunately, she worked her ass off and only got to do a few months. Um, but she said that she loved it and it was a great experience. While the MTV attention helped a little, little bit, the show did close after 30 previews and 595 regular performances, but it did not recoup its investment and was considered a financial disappointment, which is another name for a flop. But then it was reborn. Legally Blonde got a second wave, a wave that none of us saw coming when it went to the West End in London. For those of you not familiar with a couple of British musical theater things. The West End is our version of Broadway, where it's the central hub of where you're going to find high-end musical theater or where it tends to collect. And then um, the other thing is to know that the, the Lawrence Olivier Awards are our version of the Tony Awards. So just so that kind of fills in a couple of little things as I go through this. The show opened on the West End at the Savoy Theater on January 13th, 2010. So the original show closed October 2008 on Broadway. So this gives us a little over a year and a half, almost two years. And it opened with 2 million euros in advance ticket sales. So off the bat, we're already seeing a much bigger market. And of course, that has to do with the TV show. It had to do with the fact that it already had a Broadway cast recording, that people already knew about it from um, the MTV live recording of the show. But it definitely made a big, big difference. This was also the first show that the West End ever did a lottery ticket or a (laughs) a ticket lottery for. So they had never done that before. And it's really popular on Broadway, especially now. Um, Sometimes you can't see a show unless you win the lottery. Hamilton was like that for a long time. Basically, you register. You can register like once a day, twice a day. I'm sure my musical theater nerds from New York can um, correct me on that. But you put in your info, they give you an email or a call and you have to go that day. So it's very quick and you don't know till the last minute if you can get in. While the New York production may have gotten ripped off from the Tonys, the West End show won three Olivier Awards for Best New Musical, Best Actress in a Musical, who is Sheridan Smith, and Best Performance in a Supporting Role in a Musical, and that was Jill Halfpenny. The show closed in London on April 7th, 2012, after 974 performances, Ah! a.k.a. almost double of what it did on Broadway. But why did it work better on the West End? I had to dive deep to look into this because I was so fascinated with how contrasting those the sales were and the response was um, between the West End and Broadway. So what I found is that budgets on Broadway have grown so much that 10 to 15 million dollars is standard for an investment into a show. With the increase in costs, financial incentives to fix flops have also grown. So while maybe 20 years ago something would flop and they would just, you know, take what they had and walk away and let the show die and, or, you know, maybe go on a small tour, instead Shows like Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark, Shrek the Musical, and Legally Blonde, which were these huge financial investments, needed a second wave to try and recoup some of that money. So they went to, they can go to um, all kinds of different countries to do this, but the West End has become really popular. It's very accessible for Americans. So there's lower producing costs in London, so that helps sustain longer runs of the show. Legally Blonde cost $4 million to mount at the West End, which was amazing. So like I said, 10 to $15 million is typical in, on um, a Broadway stage, so it was only $4 million to mount in the West End. For weekly running costs in New York City, they were looking at $650,000 a week to run Legally Blonde the musical. A week. 650000 In London, it was almost half that, or actually it was more than half that, at 300000 
Now, this is a little sketchy because part of the reason that this is cheaper on the West End is in New York City, there's a lot of production related expenses that are negotiated through unions. Um, So negotiated wages, job guarantees, not to mention the cost of sets and equipment that are specific to Broadway stages. So while that is a little bit sketchy because that probably means people aren't getting paid as much as they should, um, it also means that certain shows are getting a second chance at life. Aside from the West End, you can also remount a show in Germany, the Netherlands, even Japan. They've all shown love for American-originated musicals. But here's what's interesting. Aside from the financial situation, which makes sense, it ran longer so it could recoup a certain amount of money. Great. But it wasn't just the money being put in. Why was it so much more successful? Why were people responding to it differently? Jerry Mitchell, who directed and choreographed the original production, also did it on the West End. They didn't change the script or the score at all. And so Jerry Mitchell said that he thinks the success on the West End was due to a more intimately sized theater. In New York City, they had a theater with 1,700 seats. And when they moved to the West End, it was 1,100. So about 600 left. That's like a third smaller, right? He also felt that there was more of an openness to embrace this breaking down of the dumb blonde stereotype, which I found interesting. I don't know why? I, I mean, I know that Brits love laughing at American stereotypes. That's definitely a thing. In fact, the lead producer in London, her name is Sonia Friedman. She thought that the London version was more successful because it was just funnier overall. Um, the British audiences love laughing at American stereotypes. And they cast a woman who was primarily a comedian to play Elle Woods. So she thought it just played better, that it was just a funnier show. But it's all speculation, honestly. Um, I think that it's, I think it has to be a combination of all of those things. The MTV show, the American stereotypes playing well in Britain. I think, you know, there's just a huge combination of that. They probably were able to do more marketing because they weren't eating up so much of their funds just on weekly runs and weekly show costs, which is you know, fascinating to me. <laughs> um, so it, I think it was probably a little bit of everything. But it is it is interesting that like the dumb blonde stereotype didn't play as well in America, that maybe it's just too fresh. Maybe women aren't, especially women who aren't connected to Elle Woods like some are, might feel offended by that character. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Fans of theater are weird. And people who just go to see shows knowing they're going to hate them, that happens all the time, too. I saw so many reviews that were like, oh, I almost got drunk before I had to go into this show because I can't imagine sitting through two and a half hours of this. I'm like, why would you even, why would you go? You're going to go in with that attitude? Like, go watch Les Mis for the 17th time. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Legally Blonde has been performed in South Korea, China, Malaysia, Japan, the Netherlands, the Philippines, Sweden, Finland, Austria, the Dominican Republic, Panama, New Zealand, Germany, France, and Australia. So this has become a global phenomenon, and this is something that people love all over the place. But why are some people still so in love with this show? That's the big question. And I've been struggling so hard because I want to give a definitive answer. And for me, I... I actually love the musical more than I love the film, which is silly, I know, but that's because of who I am as a person. I love Reese Witherspoon, but Laura Bell Bundy just got me. And, you know, I even asked my sister because she is not a typical theater goer. She likes alternative stuff. She likes things that are a little off the beaten path. And I was like, Kai, why do you love this show so much? What was it about Legally Blonde? And so we we talked it talked it out and we we discovered a couple of things. One, anytime you can see the live version of a performance, whether or not it's on TV is so helpful to add context because if you don't see the choreography that these people are doing, then the music for the dance breaks can seem a little repetitive or flat. Um, but when you see like these huge glittery costumes and the crazy costume changes, the 
the ensemble in this cast is wickedly talented and you have to be so charismatic and on the whole time. It's just, it truly is a feat to watch on stage. So I thought, you know, like that's part of it is, is the, just the awe that I, that I had and that, you know, like my sister said, it was just seeing it on MTV and being able to see the live performance was really helpful to to really see the humor, to be able to to see all the physical humor. It's such a physically funny show. So that was part of it. But we just kept coming back to the fact that it's fun, that this is a show that it really reminds me of like a Monty Python where things will be said that'll kind of go over your head a little bit. Um, and then you catch the joke. And again, sometimes those play out better visually. But lyrically, there's a lot of really great puns and silly jokes in it there's a lot of underhanded humor they they make fun of themselves in the show um there's this great number uh called take it like a man and it's when Elle Woods wants to thank Emmett Forrest uh her TA for helping her so much and they become friends at this point and so she takes him to a department store and she wants to buy him a nice suit for court so that he can really show, you know, he, she wants him to look how he sounds because he's so brilliant, but he looks like a schlub. And while they're singing and they're talking about, you know, this is the this is the great thing. You can change the outside, but the inside is still you. It's just a more polished version. You have these actors who are spraying perfume and you're watching Emmett fall in love with Elle and then they'll spritz the perfume and they'll be like, love. And he, he's like, what? What? Love, the new fragrance by Calvin Klein. Right. Like, so it, it's all these kind of silly underhanded moments. There's another one where they spray the perfume and say it's called subtext. Um, so it's playing with the traditional model of a rom-com or a a romantic musical because they're saying we know what we're doing we see what we're doing and it's a joke it's supposed to be fun and it'll go from something silly like that to a really honest moment where he you know Emmett comes out and he's dressed up in the suit and he looks great and he goes wow I look like your ex she goes yeah but that's the best part the outside is new but now it reflects what's already in you and I love that because that's truly the meaning of Legally Blonde is that it the exterior can be whatever you want it to be. It can be a polished version. It can be pink. It can be blonde. It can be the schlubby professor. But you're still you. And that's what matters. And so it, it's just such a great balance. The show flips between these really silly moments where it's making fun of itself to very honest, pure, and sometimes sad um, acknowledgements. And I think that's really special. Yeah. Well, let's see. Reasons I love this show. We've talked about how fun it is. We've talked about how crazy talented everyone is. The choreography is amazing. I mean, just the, the notes, the notes that Elle Woods belts in this musical are insane. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to the soundtrack, listen to the song so much better and just wait, just, oh, just wait for that moment at the end because she has been dancing. She has been acting her ass off. And then she hits this note that just, I have goosebumps right now. It's every musical theater soprano's dream to be able to belt it. <laughs> I'll just, I'll say that. There's also a lot of musical magic in this show. Uh, a lot of fun tricks on the stage where they're quick quick on stage costume changes when they do the intro song uh l changes on stage into a brand new dress and when you watch the mtv version they show you that it's all magnets so there's like this really cool reveal where they quickly change her on stage and it's just pulling off the dress that's on with magnets um, and it's just those little details that i think really add a lot of magic to the show as far as the other piece of this, which is women in law, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it is important to me to mention that this film and Amanda Brown's original novel was making a very valid point about law school. And I grew up with a father who always wanted to be a lawyer, but always advised students that law school is not what you expect. And um, by that, I mean 
it's really tough. Um, you carry a lot of weight around with you as a lawyer, depending on the type of law you do. It's cutthroat for sure. Um, but that you can do a lot of good. While women make up a third of lawyers, which is already not much, they only make up 18% of law firm equity partners, even though they enter the profession traditionally at the same rate as their male counterparts as associates. So like similar graduation rate, go on, get an associate position. Men are much more likely to be promoted to partnership than women are, considerably. And in the 231-year history of the Supreme Court, only four of the 113 justices in our history have been female. And that's been within the last century. That's Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Alina Kagan. So I wanted to make sure that people understand, like, while yes, it is super fun and flippant, the issues that this brings up and other women in the show also talk about, um, there's a character, Vivian, who starts out as the antagonist and turns out to be a friend. But she also is very cutthroat because she says, like, you have to be like, this is not a woman's profession. We have to be more aggressive. We have to be um, against each other. And Elle can't understand that because she's all about sisterhood. And, you know, she came from a sorority. And Vivian's like, no, how are you going to survive here if you're not willing to cut down your classmates? It's not about gender. It's about survival. And that is still very, very relevant. And that can be for a variety of reasons. Back in the the 50s and 60s, um, it was often referred to that women don't go into law and aren't as successful at it because of family responsibilities, which we all know is crap. Um, What it really is, is just law firms tending to be a boys club and keeping it within the family. So, it's going to end up going to their best friend's son who just graduated um, instead of the associate who's been there for like five, ten years and is killing it because she's a woman. These are That's just the nature of things. And it's still very prevalent. So I just wanted to mention that like that is still something that is very, um, very common. The other piece of this is I think one of the biggest reasons Legally Blonde is successful is because it actually shows true feminism. And by true feminism, I mean breaking social norms and roles. That there are women like Vivian um, or Enid, who is kind of like the weird hippie lawyer. Um, They're all very different women and they are all very successful. And that includes Elle Woods, that she is not a stereotype, that she is not a dumb blonde, that she is, you know, she gets a 179 on the LSATs. And that is one point below the highest score. Um, She graduates as valedictorian. She has a 4.0 at her undergrad university. Um, She refuses Callahan's advances and won't take his offer of a summer job because he hits on her. She's she's not going to be played that way. So it's important that even though you want to stereotype somebody, true feminism is seeing the whole person. That it doesn't matter what type of woman you are or it, how you identify that your feminism is equal to everyone else's and that your power as a woman is uh, just as important. Whether or not you're blonde and you love pink and you love princesses, or even if you are a super alternative goth chick who's super hardcore and into protesting and social justice, it doesn't matter that these are both great examples of fantastic and smart women. And Legally Blonde looks at the person and looks at these women as whole people and breaks down that idea that of the dumb blonde or, you know, the stuck up preppy girl. And I, I love that about this story, especially when it's told in such a fun way. It doesn't feel like it's trying to teach you about equity. It, it feels like you're on a fun, silly ride with Elle Woods in her pink convertible. So I think it's a very special story. I think it's a very special musical. And I'm so glad that I got that second wind in uh, the West End because I think I would love to see it kind of, you know, come back, do a revival national tour of some sort. 
I think it's an important story. I would also love to see it gender bent. Make her a lesbian. I don't know. Make it interesting. Change it up. I don't know how we do it, but I, I'm always into that. So that is Legally Blonde, the musical. And I hope that you enjoyed the trip down um, sorority lane, <laughs> I guess. Sorority row. Is that what they call it? I'm so not sorority oriented. I don't even know what they call it. Um, but next up on the pod is a show that I am so excited to get into because it is simultaneously one of my favorites and least favorites, depending on the day. Um, and that is Into the Woods. Into the Woods. Um, and that is a Sondheim classic. And I am so excited to talk all the smack about the movie. Don't worry, I love Meryl Streep. I love all the actors. It's just, it was a really boring movie. And I'm super excited to tell you all about it. This show is fantastic. Sondheim has a bizarre creative process. So as we talked about in um, Sunday in the Park with George, you know, it's it's got, it's going to have a lot of meat to it. So I'm really excited about that one. And um, don't forget to look at what your local theaters are doing. So many local artists are live streaming performances from their garages. Um, I know here in Phoenix, one of our favorite companies, All Puppet Players, has been doing like fun live streaming of their old shows. Um, And you have to watch them at the moment because then they go offline, but it's super fun. Um, There's all kinds of stuff happening. So while in quarantine, don't get bogged down look and see what your local theaters are doing or local actors that you love because I guarantee they're doing something during quarantine that is entertaining. Um, As well, if you can support your local businesses and local arts organizations through gift certificates or you know, maybe consider not getting a refund on that show that was closed, but keep your money with the organization. Those things make a huge difference. I know the theater that I work at is really struggling with that right now and every little bit helps. So um, yeah, stay entertained. It's quarantine. Grab a puzzle, listen to a musical, learn something new um, or take naps because that's equally as important. So yay. Thank you so much, you guys, for tuning in to Legally Blonde. I hope that this made you rethink the show and the movie a little bit and maybe think about it from a different angle. And that would be my goal for this week. So happy quarantine to all of you. I hope you guys take care. Stay healthy. I wish I could hug everybody. I want to hug the whole world right now. And um, yeah, stay safe, everybody. (laughs) 